All right, everybody. Well, I appreciate you coming back out tonight, and I do like speaking on this subject. Um, although, uh, I think anybody who speaks on the home feels like a hypocrite when they do it, okay? Uh, if we're being completely honest, uh, all of us are a work in progress, right? And uh, none of us have got it figured out when it comes to uh, anything, and some of you have been married three, four, five, ti five times as long as what Emily and I have. We've been married nine years. Um, but I'm thankful that it's not just the experience that is necessary to teach. What's really necessary is that you know what the Bible says. And uh, that's where we're going to be uh, focusing. That's what we're going to be focusing on uh, here tonight. Now, in all my years of um, marriage counseling, um, I've done quite a bit throughout the years. Um, in all of my years of studying marriage, reading marriage books, um, and doing research on the subject of marriage, uh, one of the things that um, I have, this, oh, he's getting that chair there. One of the things that I have encountered is that there really are um, about six different areas that couples tend to struggle the most, okay? I'm going to give those to you here very quickly. And consequently, uh, uh, in many uh, uh, research organizations on the subject of marriage, they have discovered that these are the six uh, leading causes of divorce, uh, Christian, uh, Christian research uh, companies like Barna, Focus on the Family, uh, they have brought forward these things. The first leading cause of issues in the home is spiritual apathy, okay? Um, a husband or a wife just simply not walking with God or not knowing God at all, not having God in their life. A second cause for this is finances. Uh, and from, in the secular world, they would say that finances is the number one cause of divorce, disagreement over finances, all right? And so there's finances. A third uh, issue in a, in, that rises in a marriage is uh, over child rearing, all right? Uh, husbands and wives disagree on raising their kids and how to raise their kids, or they get so focused on raising their kids that they forget about each other. And then the last kid's gone, and they look at each other and say, who are you? <laughs> I haven't talked to you for 20 years. And uh, it's like they have to, they don't know, know each other anymore. And it leads to a lot of couples. It's amazing. In midlife, when kids are gone, they get divorced. Another uh, fourth reason for issues in marriage um, are, are intimacy issues. You can just put intimacy. And that would include unfaithfulness, but it's not only unfaithfulness. Uh, intimacy issues. And that, that goes, uh, that covers several different areas. Emotional, spiritual, relational, and of course physical intimacy. And they're all interconnected. Um, but it's an issue uh, that leads to problems in the home. Then a fifth issue would be uh, extended family and friends. You know, there's a reason God, the first principle of marriage in the book of Genesis that God made was, for this reason you should leave your father and mother. It's the first thing that, Jesus, that, that the Bible says you're supposed to do as a principle of marriage is to leave and cleave to your spouse. And a lot of couples struggle because they have problems with leaving. Um, they let mom or dad still have too much influence in their new wedded union with someone else. And contrawise, a lot of issues come because a single person um, starts, loves the single life and they get married and they, they don't want to give up the single life. They don't want to give up their friends. They don't want to give up hanging out. It causes a lot of issues in marriages. And then a, a sixth issue is, uh, I, this is how I say it, um, they, a couple stops dreaming together. I wouldn't say this one's as common, although it's probably more common than you think. But literally, you can come to a place in your marriage where you just become stagnant. You see, you see no future together. Um, and that's a dangerous place for you to get to. Um, there's no vision for the future. You're writing each other out of each other's lives. Your dreams no longer involve each other. It involves a career. It involves another relationship, or so on and so forth. It causes issues in the home. Here's the reason I bring those up to start this session out. All of those issues could be eliminated if the lines of communication are kept open in the relationship. It is because husbands and wives do not talk. They do not communicate about the struggles that they're facing. They do not communicate about the things that are going on truly in their lives. That is why every one of those issues come up in the home. And that is why the subject of communication is so important for us to understand in the context of our marriages. Now, any trouble in a marriage can ultimately go back to a failure in communication. 
And any, any problem that you're having in your home, I'll tell you where it started. You stop talking to each other. And you stop being willing to open up to each other. Maybe you're talking, but what you're talking about is hateful and not helpful. And uh, just because you're yelling at each other doesn't mean you're communicating. You understand that, right? Uh, that's not communication. That's not biblical communication. And really, every issue in the home can be traced back to a failure to communicate. And so the question I ask as we start tonight is, would you be willing to take the necessary measures to better your marriage by improving your communication? Now, you may be sitting here tonight and thinking, well, I think we're pretty good on communication. But why don't you ask your spouse that question, okay? In all seriousness, why don't you ask your spouse that question? You may think you're good, and that may be the problem. You're not, okay? Um, and uh, uh, if you are doing pretty good when it comes to communication, listen, all of us can do better. And I think there's something for every one of us in here, whether you're married or whether you're not. Uh, you may be married one day. You may be married again one day. And these are principles you need to understand. Some of you that aren't married, you have children who are. These principles can help them. Um, there are so many applications to this. I'm excited to give you this stuff. Uh, things that God has taught me from his word. A lot of this I've learned from reading, um, from, from going to uh, sessions, listening to sessions on marriage myself. And I'm excited to give this stuff to you. But let's pray. Ask God to speak to our hearts. We'll dive into this here tonight. Our Father, we come before you. We thank you for this time to open your word. Lord, I pray that it would be practical and helpful, biblical. And Lord, that it would bring strength to marriages in this room. Uh, and marriages who will be impacted from another sharing what they've heard in this room here tonight. Even a, a video or a podcast that's listened to later. I pray that, that uh, the people will just benefit from these principles. Uh, all of them are not unique to me. Um, all of them, I think, come from your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified through the things that are expressed here tonight. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Tonight, I want you to notice with me uh, five truths about communication that will help your marriage. Five truths about communication that will help your marriage. Number one here tonight, we're gonna to look at the principles of communication. The principles of communication. What is communication? We need to establish that first because to some of you it might be something else uh, than what your spouse thinks it is. But at base level, Webster's 1828 um, tells us that communication is the act of imparting or delivering from one person to another. It's imparting or delivering from one person to another. That's what communication is in its basic sense. And so just because you have spoken words or heard words spoken, you have not necessarily communicated. If something hasn't been delivered, if something hasn't been imparted, then there's no communication, okay? Especially with you wise towards your husbands, right? You're trying to communicate, but they're not hearing it, okay? Uh, you know that because you ask them what you said and they have no clue, all right? I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, okay? That's not communication. Um, now, a lot of times we think we're communicating because we are talking. Um, but communication involves you imparting or delivering something from yourself to someone else. Of course, in the context of marriage, from you to your spouse. And so it's not just what you say to your mate, but it's what your mate thinks that you said. It's how your mate understands what you said. That determines if true communication has taken place. Uh, so that's important for us to get there. Communication involves much more than just the words that you speak. Um, uh, most of you know me, me preaching. I'm not just communicating with the words I'm speaking. I'm communicating with my gestures. I'm communicating through emotion. Now, some preachers, I think, abuse communicating through emotion. But I lay that aside. But we communicate oftentimes more by what we don't say than by what we do. All right? You ever gotten the look? All right? I've gotten the look before. And I, you don't have to say anything. I know exactly what that means, okay? Uh, there's a lot of unspoken communication. Communication, uh, one person said, is 35% emotion. And uh, it's a lot more than just the words that you say. I think that's important. So a good communicator recognizes that all the senses are a vital part of giving and receiving information. It's little things, like eye contact. It annoys the fire out of me. I'm trying to talk to somebody, and they won't look at me. All right? 
I'm not saying that because you're not looking at me right now, all right? But, um, you know, in a private conversation. That's why I work. I'm not good, perfect at this, but I work really hard after Sunday services when people are shaking my hand and they're trying to talk to me not to break eye contact because the second I break eye contact, they want to walk away because they're like, well, he doesn't care what I'm having to say. If that's true with the pastor to someone in the church, how much more true it is between a husband and a wife. Husbands, you're not communicating because your wife's talking to you and you're watching the television. You get that? <laughs> All right? That's not communication. Shut the TV off. Hey, the thing that's worse today are the phones, the devices. We say we're talking to each other, but what we're actually looking at and listening to is whatever's on the screen. Be it a social media, be it a book, be it whatever it may be, a game. Um, and so uh, understand these principles of communication. So what is in your speech then reveals... Um, what is really in your heart. Uh, moving on to something else here, principle of communication. What is in your speech reveals what is really in your heart. I want us to go to the scriptures together here. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 45. Luke chapter 6 and verse 45. Uh, I said this a moment ago, but sometimes you say more by what you don't say than by what you do. But all the time, if it comes out of your mouth, it's revealing something that is within your heart. Sometimes we say hurtful things to each other, and then we come back and say, I didn't really mean that. You said it, it came out of your heart. Right. Be careful about thinking that. If it comes out of your mouth, it came from somewhere. It might be your old dead sinful nature, but it came from somewhere, and it's something that needs to be dealt with. Luke chapter 6 and verse 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. Good man brings forth good treasure, evil man brings forth evil treasure. What are you talking about? How are you talking to each other? Some important principles about communication here. Your speech reveals what's in your heart. Here's another thing. Your words have power. Pastor, your mic is on. Your mic is on. It's going out. Beep. Thank you. Is it going out? Yeah. Sounds static. Sounds static. Let me just switch to the other microphone. How about that? Probably just needs new batteries. Thank you guys for letting me know that because last time uh, we didn't do that and then it wasn't recorded. So that's no good. Here's another principle for you here uh, about communication. Your words have power to build bridges or burn bridges. I learned this from brother Tim Raven. Uh, he's the first. Uh, he, he actually spoke to our couples retreat a couple years ago. Your words have power to either build bridges or burn bridges. A good word can literally change someone's life, and it can certainly make someone's day better. The Bible says in Proverbs 12 and verse 25, "Heaviness in the heart of man makes it stoop, but a good word makes it glad." How many times have you heard someone come and just say something kind to you and it just changed your whole day? Friend, that's even, that should be even more true in our homes. The words that we're using towards each other should be kind, should be good. A good word can make a, good word can make a marriage better. All right? this, this biting and devouring of each other within the context of the home, it does nothing to help. It only hurts. Another thing I'd say is, if you only ever speak harsh or negatively to your spouse, it will cause problems in your marriage and in your home. If it's all negative, if it's all a huff, it's all, well, uh, how dare you speak to me? I'm busy, <laughs> okay? Um, we can have all types of problems when it comes to our communication within our home. All right? Sometimes it isn't that we're saying something mean, but it's how we're saying something nice, okay? Uh, sometimes it's the tone of voice uh, that we're using towards each other that is mean, that is harsh. The Bible says in uh, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Grievous words stir up anger. You know, you're always on nails at, always on nails at your house. Grievous words stir up anger. The, way you're, the words you're speaking to each other, the way you often talk to each other, that is causing so much of the issues that are actually taking place in your home. It starts with your communication or your lack of communication. That's an important principle for us to understand from the Bible here. And by the way, uh, you've turned with me over to Proverbs chapter 16 here. I want you to see this. 
You can learn to communicate biblically. Don't sit here tonight and say, well, this is just how I am. Get used to it. <laughs> I told you I loved you once and I hadn't changed my mind. If I do, I'll let you know. All right, we've all heard it before. Just because it's the way you have been doesn't mean that you can't and shouldn't change. And you can change, but you can change to communicate biblically. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number uh, 23. If you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says there, The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. A wise person teaches his mouth, adds learning to his lips. In other words, you can learn how to communicate effectively if you'd be willing to apply these principles about communication to your relationships. Hey, and as much as these are true for a husband and wife, really these principles in some degree are true for all of our relationships um, in, in this matter of communication. And uh, it's interesting to me, um, go over to Psalm chapter 19 with me if you would. Psalm chapter 19. I know I'm blasting you with a lot of principles here tonight. Uh, but I want to lay a foundation for the other things we're going to talk about here. Uh, Psalm chapter number 19. If you think about it, when your thoughts and corresponding words are acceptable to God, they will, by natural course, be acceptable and pleasing to your spouse, to the other people that are in your life. Psalm chapter 19 and verse 14, the psalmist prayed, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That was a prayer the psalmist prayed to the Lord, and really, that's a prayer that should guide our communication, especially with our spouse and the people that are closest to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and the things that I'm dwelling on and even thinking about saying be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. And uh, if our communication is pleasing to the Lord, you can be sure it'll be pleasing to the people uh, that are close to us in our life as well. And so those are some preliminary uh, principles about communication. Here's a second truth about communication I want us to look at. First, we saw the principles of communication. But secondly, I want us to think about the priority of communication. The priority of communication. Communication is not just a good idea. For marriage. It is absolutely essential to have a biblical, healthy marriage. And I told you before, all the issues that marriages face find their root in a lack of communication. And so having good biblical communication is absolutely essential to having a godly marriage as well. And uh, that's why we want to focus on this subject here tonight. Now go over with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I want us to see this here because here in Ephesians 5, some New Testament instruction is given um, for uh, husbands and wives in the context of the home. And here in verse number 25 of Ephesians 5, God actually instructs the husband to communicate something. See if you can catch what it is. All right? Hebrews 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. All right, man, help me out here. What did God just command you to communicate to your wife? Love. Love your wife. Husbands are instructed in the scripture to communicate loving service to their wife. Now the Greek word that is used for love there is agapeo. And it's a Greek word that literally speaks of a sacrificial and a volitional or a willing selfless love. In other words, you are choosing and exerting yourself as Christ sacrificed his life to prove his love to his church. So we are to sacrifice our lives as husbands, not always literally, but to that extent if necessary, um, in the service of showing our wives how much we love them. And that's, that's the agapeo love. It's something that you're sacrificing yourself, your own health, your own well-being, your own pleasure, your own satisfaction. You're sacrificing the things that you think you want for yourself to do what is in the best interest of your wife. That's the kind of love that the Bible says husbands are to communicate to their wives. On the other side of things, God instructs the wife to communicate loving respect to her husband. 
Look at verse number 33 of Ephesians 5. Verse number 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she what? Reverence her husband. To show respect to um, her husband. And uh, there's a great book on, on this concept. I'm going to recommend several books to you here today uh, that will help your marriage if you've never read them. This book is called Love and Respect. It talks about the role of women, uh, the role of men, and how, uh, how the, those two, these two principles that God teaches really complement each other in the, uh, in the context of the home. But it's interesting, the Bible never tells the wife to love her husband with agape o love. Now there's a general principle that's given for wives to love their husbands in the scripture as they are to uh, love anyone. And the word that's used for that is not agapeo, but it's phileo love. All right? And uh, what that love is, is it's an affectionate love. Um, and so husbands are to love uh, their wives of their own volition and sacrificially. Wives love their husbands in a little bit of a different way. It's an affectionate uh, type of love. Uh, not one that's right, one that's wrong. But it gives us a distinction of understanding the difference between men and women and their roles. And so we need to, we're commanded to, I should say, communicate as husbands and wives these various things towards each other. Husbands are commanded to communicate love to their wife. Wives are commanded to communicate reverence to their husbands. Now here's the thing. When a husband and wife don't communicate, it will result in great problems in the relationship. There's a reason why God said do this. Because if you don't do this, you're heading in a bad direction and you're going there very fast. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 with me if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and uh, verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 3. <clears throat> The Bible says here, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power over her own body but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again. And read the last phrase with me out loud. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now that's an interesting word right there. Now, in context, what's primarily being spoken about in this passage of Scripture is physical intimacy. You read the first verse, it says, Now concerning the things whatever you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's still true today in 2021, by the way. You're not married, don't touch her. Amen, glory to God, hallelujah, okay? Um, but it's primarily talking about physical intimacy here. Um, but when a man and a wife are not intimate emotionally and relationally, it will impact their intimacy physically as well. Here's another book recommendation. This one, uh, you may or may not like the name of it, but it actually does have some really good principles about this. It's a book called uh, Sex Begins in the Kitchen. Now, I know that sounds very interesting, but it's actually great on the subject of intimacy, and I do recommend that book to you there. But listen, intimacy is not just for the bedroom. Intimacy takes place all throughout the day. There's a social intimacy. There's a relational intimacy that are absolutely so important for us to understand as husbands and wives. And so what the Bible's teaching here in this passage is that if you keep defrauding each other intimately, you are opening your marriage up to satanic temptation to some degree. You defraud each other. Unless, unless you've just agreed, we're going to fast from uh, a form of communication or a form of intimacy for a time to seek the Lord and to seek the Lord's will. That's okay as long as it's agreed upon time. That as the caveat, if you're defrauding each other, robbing each other of intimacy from each other, whether it be physical or emotional or whatever it may be, you are opening up your home literally to temptation, satanic temptation. You are inviting problems into your home. You are opening your front door and saying, all right, devil, come on in. That's literally what you're doing if you are robbing each other intimately in your relationship. You are not communicating what God has commanded you to communicate in your home. 
Husbands, love your wives. Wives, reverence your husbands. And, uh, and so we see the problems begin when the communication begins to break down. And this is why I entitled this session, Communicate or Disintegrate. Because if you don't make communication a priority in your marriage, it will destroy your marriage. It will destroy it. And some of you, you can testify to that fact here tonight. A lack of communication destroys a marriage. You don't want to go down that road. Make it a priority. We see the principles of communication. We see the priority of communication. A third thing I want us to see is the problems. The problems of communication. Now, most issues with communication can be effectively dealt with if you understand them. And so I'm going to try to give you some major problems in communication so that you can understand them. And if you've been having problems in your home, in your marriage, with communicating, perhaps you'll be able to identify with some of these here tonight. Whether you've been married one year or 50 years, we all have struggles with this from time to time. The first one is this, misunderstandings. Misunderstandings. What I'm talking about there is the difference between the message and the motive of the message. All right? Now, sometimes our spouse says something to us and we prescribe motives to their statement that they didn't have. One of the worst forms of communication, by the way, is text messaging. All right? Don't get mad at somebody over a text message. Just call them and ask them what they meant, okay? Um, because it is incredibly hard to communicate effectively through a text message. It can be taken in so many different ways. All right? But misunderstanding causes a lot of issues. Uh, much of the misunderstandings that arise in communication between a husband and wife are rooted in their misunderstanding the difference between how men and women communicate in general. We are different creatures. And uh, I neglected to get this video pulled up here, but one of my favorite videos about this is a video, there's a lady... And uh, she's trying to talk to her husband, and she's saying, I've got this problem. And, um, well, she has a nail sticking out of the back of her head. How many of you have seen that video before? She has a nail sticking out of the back of her head, and she keeps on wanting to talk about it. And the husband said, well, there's a nail on the back of your head. And she says, it's not about the nail, okay? And she just wants to talk about it. And it's, 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 it's an, uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing it justice. It's a hilarious video. But uh, they, uh, she, he finally just gives up and he just sits there and listens to her for a while. Talk about the nail. It's, all of her sweaters are getting snagged and all these problems are happening in her life. And he sits there and at the end of the video, he just goes, that sounds really bad. I'm sorry, honey, that you have to go through that. And she looks at him and she goes, thank you, honey. Then they try to kiss each other and she hits him in the face with the nail. He's like, can we please do something about the nail? But we as men, we're fixers. We like to try to fix things. And so our wife tries to talk to us, and they don't want us to fix it. They just want us to listen, okay? They want somebody to listen to them, not solve all their problems, just listen. We're fixers. And so immediately our wife tries to talk to us, and we try to fix it. And that frustrates her because that's not how women roll. That's not how they operate. We misunderstand each other as men and women, it leads to a lot of problems in communication. i got to move on. Number two, another problem in communication are assumptions. Assumptions. That is taking something for granted. All right? Assuming because of what you said or how you said what you said or because you didn't say what you thought they were going to say. I can put these all different kinds of ways. But uh, assuming is always a bad thing. It's never wrong to ask for clarification. But it is wrong to assume when, 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 the, when it very well may not be true, all right? A third issue is interruption. Oh, this is a big one right here. Interruption, all right? If you won't let them speak, then eventually they just stop speaking. You obviously don't want them to speak, or when they try to talk, you interrupt them, and it silences communication. Um, interrupting, one person said, kills all true communication. Have you ever tried to tell a story before? And there's that person that always interrupts you. Eventually, it just shuts you down. You're like, well, okay. If you want to talk, you want to listen to yourself talk, that's fine. But that can happen in our marriages as well. All right? It's so important that you learn the art of listening. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Now, some of you, you, nat you are natural communicators. Um, and that's saying it nicely. Okay? 
Um, others of you, it's like, uh, it's like uh, pulling teeth to try to get you to talk and to open up. We're all different. Um, but we all do need to understand the importance of listening. And a lot of reason why someone, your spouse, may not do much talking is because they have learned by tra you're training them, you don't do very much listening. You need to be careful of that. Interrupting kills communication. Here's a fourth one. Unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations. You're expecting them to know what you expect. Can I tell you, your husband, ma'am, is not a mind reader? He doesn't know what you're thinking. And sir, your wife is not a mind reader either. And uh, boy, we're, we're guilty of this oftentimes. Unrealistic expectations. And uh, I could talk about that for a really long time, um, but I won't because we don't have the time. Number five, blame. Blame. You get defensive to prove that you're right and that they're wrong, okay? When you start blaming each other, by the way, this was the original communication problem in the first marriage, right? Adam and Eve, uh, I didn't do it, she did it. Well, I didn't do it, he did it, all right? They passed it on down. They began pointing fingers. Well, it's not my fault. Um, and uh, blaming each other is the enemy of openness. If I feel like you're going to be defensive to what I have to tell you, it makes me not want to tell you because if I tell you, you're going to attack me. All right? You're going to blame me. You're going to turn it around and make it my fault. And that kills openness. I can't be honest with you. I can't be open with you because I, I, I have to be defensive myself. That's why blame is a communication problem. Now, here's a sixth one here. Disagreement. Disagreement. Disagreement would be conflicts over the various life issues that you face. Um, and by the way, I'll just say this. You need to have a, an agreed upon process for reconciliation in your marriage. Okay? And we'll talk about this more in just a minute. But when you do have a disagreement, you need to talk about how you're going to handle disagreements in your marriage. All right? And probably what shouldn't be on that list is throwing the hairdryer at him, okay? Um, sometimes it's effective, I know, but uh, you probably better cross that off your list. All right? There's a biblical way to handle disagreement. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, but I'll say this, Ephesians 4, 26, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't you go to bed. I don't care if you have to stay up till midnight. Don't you go to bed until you, until you have a conversation about what you're frustrated with each other about. There have been some nights where Emily and I haven't resolved the issue, but we've agreed to disagree. We told each other we loved each other, and we went to bed at peace. All right? And we didn't wake up at war in the morning either, by the way. Um, and uh, you won't always be able to sort through everything before the sun goes down, but you can choose to agree, agree to disagree, and you can, you can choose we love each other, and we're going to work through this together, and we're not going to be mad at each other. Uh, you can do that, and that's so important uh, for uh, the disagreements that you face. And so you need to understand the issues that you're going to face and what you're going to do when you face these issues of communication in your, in your relationship. Um, and so uh, before I move on from the problems here, let me give you some examples of bad forms of communication because all of our personalities are a little bit different, okay? Um, and so the first uh, bad form of communication I'll give you tonight is what I like to call the exploder, okay? It's like sticking uh, Coke into a freezer and you leave it in there until poof, you open it up one day and it's all over the place. Some of you, your personality is to hold it in. You know what I'm talking about? Your, your personality is to hold it in and let it build up and let it build up until all of a sudden poof, you explode. You explode at your spouse. That is a terrible form of communication. What would be a whole lot better is to uh, 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 communicate along the way than letting it build up to a point of explosion. A second bad form of communication is the silent treatment. All right, heads bowed, eyes closed. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to ask you to <laughs> confess tonight. Um, the silent treatment. This is where I struggle. I'll just be honest with you. I struggle with this, all right? It's easier for me. It's always was easier for me just to walk away uh, or get busy doing something else. My dad called it piddling, all right? I know you heard that before. Just go out in the garage, okay? Go outside, go do something, and give the silent treatment. I'm not going to handle the issue. I'm going to ignore the issue um, is essentially what you're doing. I remember when we first got married, we were living in a 500-square-foot apartment in, uh, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, 
Uh, only now do I realize it was like the ghetto of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. But we were happy. We were living there. We got into a disagreement over something. I don't even remember what it was. But what I always did was if I got upset, so I didn't yell and I didn't throw a fit, I would just go on a walk. And so I walked out the front door and I was going on a walk and I was cooling down. I didn't say anything to her. I just walked out and I came back home. She was crying. She thought the marriage was over. Um, and she did all these things. And, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, whoa, 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 hold on. I just needed to cool down. Silent treatment. It's a terrible form of communication. I've had to learn to get outside of my box. And I need to force myself to stay in that conversation and ask the Holy Spirit to help me calm down. Um, because the silent treatment is not acceptable. Uh, an acceptable form of communication. Uh, I'll just give you these next ones because we don't have time to park on this. But nagging, oh boy. Bad, bad, bad. All right? Uh, I, I, could, I could park on that for a very long time, but I won't. Um, leaving overnight or longer. Listen, that's acceptable in today's culture. That is not acceptable as a form of biblical communication towards each other. So I, just need to, I just need to go blow off some steam. I just need to cool down. You don't leave for a night. You, don't, you let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You work through your issues. And leaving overnight, not a good idea. Not going to strengthen your marriage. And here's, a, here's, a, here's a, another one I'll give you real quick. Uh, leaving without saying anything. Ever been frustrated with each other in the morning or before you go and do something? And then even as you're going out the door, you're still fighting and you're saying it and you slam the door. You know what I'm talking about? All right? Terrible. Terrible. We joke, we joke about it. We laugh about it because some of us have been guilty of it. But friend, it's a horrible way uh, to practice communication toward each other in your relationship. What are some good forms of communication then? We see some problems here. Uh, uh, Miss Daisy May, she gave me this. She called it the big three. I can't remember right now how long her and Lyman were married. But she said, here's the big three. You need to learn this, Pastor Bruce. She told me. Um, she told me this, and then she wrote me a letter to make sure I got it. Okay? This was how important it was for her. The big three. I love you. I am sorry. Please forgive me. He said, that's so basic. Yeah, it's so basic, but we don't practice it very well all the time, do we? I love you. I am sorry. Please forgive me. All right? Those three statements may very well change your marriage if you just learn to deal with your issues um, by using those three statements right there. And uh, uh, so, much, so much that we could say along these lines. Um, you know, when you are having issues with each other, a great thing for you to do is to come to your spouse in a calm, collected way, and say something along the lines of, I'm not trying to prove my point or to start a fight, but we really need to talk about this. A statement just as simple as that can help you start a conversation. All right? Here's a bad way to do it. When are we going to talk about that? When are you going to deal with that? Were you ever going to talk to me about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, you don't want to speak to each other accusatively or condemningly or condescendingly. All right? We need to practice grace towards each other. We talk about practicing grace toward lost people, towards people outside the church, people within the church. How much more should, should it be so with the person nearest to us in this world, our spouse? All right? And so uh, understand that these good forms of communication. Another good form of communication would be to give compliments and praise to each other. Well, that's a novel idea. I don't know if this is true. I don't know where people come up with this stuff, but it's a good statement nonetheless. One person said it takes 10 compliments or 10 positive uh, statements to undo one negative statement to somebody. All right? So if, you are a me if you're a jerk to your wife and say something mean, you've got a lot of making up to do, buddy. Um, and there's some truth to that, okay? Um, but uh, we are not just speaking kindly to each other um, to make up for the bad blend blunders that we've made. It should be a habit of our life. Men, you ought to train yourself to watch your wife and learn to be thankful for the things that she does. To keep your home, I, to help you as a husband, to help you as a man. She makes you look good. And you're not even thankful for it. You ought to look for ways to express thankfulness to your wife for how she's a blessing.
right? And the same thing's true of wives towards husbands. Learn to express praise and compliments towards each other. It will revolutionize your marriage. Here's a fourth truth we'll look at, and I've got to move quick on this. I want to talk about the parameters of communication. The parameters of communication. Different people communicate in different ways. Not all of us are the same. Our personalities are different. Our, our circumstances and backgrounds are different. I've already said men and women dip, uh, communicate in different ways as well. A great book on that subject, by the way, if you want to read it, is a book called Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti. <laughs> have, have anybody read that book before? Men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti. The short of it is men think in boxes, all right? All right? We're only in one box at a time. You, know, you think of a waffle with all the boxes. Women are more like a bowl of spaghetti. All right? It's all connected. One noodle connects to another noodle, connects to another noodle, connects to another noodle. All right? and so they could be talking about one thing, and you're in that box talking about that. And then two seconds later, they're way over here. And you're wondering what that has to do about the box that you're in at this current moment in time. All right? And so understanding those differences is great. You, you read the book for yourself. It's hilarious. It's also very helpful. It changed my life as a young man, understanding how my wife thought differently than I did. But in the context of your home, you, we do need to understand that we're different creatures and that we function in different ways. But we also need to understand that we communicate in different ways as well. Specifically, we communicate love towards each other in different ways. And uh, Gary Chapman um, is one of uh, just a, such a great writer on marriage in the home. Gary Chapman wrote a book called uh, The Five Love Languages. And uh, does, uh, does, uh, he elaborates what I'm about to just share with you briefly in such a better way. Um, but in that book, he talks and he, he brings scripture into it. And he talks about how all of us have basically, um, there are five different love languages that exist in this world. And all of us have two of them that are dominant for us. Now, let me give these to you very quickly. And by the way, I know this is a lot of information. I'll give you my notes if you want them. If you are just, your, your wrist is getting tired, okay? Um, but the first one is words of affirmation, all right? In other words, you feel very loved when someone compliments you, when someone affirms you with their words. The second love language would be quality time, all right? Just spending time together. You feel very loved when someone spends time with you. The third love language would be receiving gifts, all right? This was all of our love language when we were kids, right? Um, but it may not be so much now that we're older. Uh, number four, acts of service. When someone does something for you, you feel very loved. And the fifth would be physical touch, uh, a, a love language. When, when you get a hug, when you get a kiss, um, even physical intimacy, uh, you feel very loved uh, through that kind of thing. Now, here's the kicker. How we most want to express love to our spouse is how we, most, or how we best receive love ourselves. He talks about this. Chapman talks about it in his book, The Five Love Languages. So just to break it down for you very quickly here. Uh, for me, probably my most dominant love language is um, uh, acts of service. Um, somebody does something for me, I feel very appreciated, feel very loved. Um, and so when we first, for my wife, it's not that way. My wife's love language is quality time. And when someone will spend time with her, she feels very loved. And so this is what happened when we first got married. I would come home from, from work, and I'd want to tell, show my wife how much I loved her. I would do all the dishes. I would sweep. I would do stuff. I'd be busy doing stuff. And I'm thinking, man, she's going to really know I love her. Meanwhile, she's sitting in there taking care of the baby and thinking, why won't he ever spend any time with me? <laughs> because that's how she receives love. And if you're really going to learn to communicate love to each other, you need to learn how your spouse receives love. And you need to try to communicate love to them in that way. If anybody knows me, you know I hate sitting down, okay? I want to be doing something. I want to be active doing something. It is very hard for me to just sit down and enjoy the moment, but that is what Emily needs. And by the way, that's helped me grow a lot. And, uh, but that is how she receives love. And you need to study each other as husband and wife, okay? You need to, in fact, 
Chapman, you can go on his website, Five Love Languages, and he actually has a test you can take uh, to see what your love languages are. And uh, it's actually a kind of a fun thing to do, learning what your spouse's love languages are. Then you study it and learn, that's how I'm going to try to express love to her. That's how I'm going to try to express love to him. And so what I'm getting at here is you just need to understand the parameters of communication. We're all different. We communicate in different ways. We give and receive love in different ways. And it's important you understand the distinction there. The last truth I want us to look at and we'll be done is the process of communication. The process of communication. Um, to communicate well over the long haul, you're going to stay married and stay close in your relationship with each other. You must commit yourself to work at walking through the process that leads to deep communication. Communicating goes against our nature. By nature, to communicate on a deep level, that's a very rare thing. I had somebody tell me one time, to have a real best friend, somebody you can pour your heart out to, is something that'll probably happen once or twice in your life. Most of us, we have people we're close to, but we wouldn't pour our hearts out to them. We wouldn't tell them what's really going on behind the scenes in our life. That's even true in this church. There are very few people in this world that we can get to the deepest level of communication with. But if there's anyone that we should be able to communicate deeply with, it should be our spouse. And unless you understand how to get to the deep level of communication, you'll never get there. Some of you, I'm about to share this with you, and you may realize that it's, it's been years since you've really deeply communicated with your spouse. I want you to understand what I'm about to share with you as we close this thing out. There are different levels of communication. You've got to start at the lower level and build up to the higher levels to get to, de uh, get to the deep level of communication. And so the first level here is what we'll call the acquaintance level. The acquaintance level. At this, at this level of communication, you're talking about your typical, routine, um, off-repeated comments and questions and just the answers that you give out without even thinking about it. It's you come home and, hey, hey, how you doing? Fine, how are you? <laughs> okay. Um, most of the time we ask, how are you doing? And we don't even wait for somebody to respond. Okay, we just, that's just our American culture. That is your acquaintance level. You're not really knowing the person. Uh, that's the acquaintance level of communication. Now, it'd be unpolite not to start there, all right, just to ignore them. Um, you got to start somewhere. But you certainly need to go beyond that. And so level one is the acquaintance level. No, and level two would be the facts, the facts level. At this point, you begin sharing information about weather and the office and friends and news and personal activities. It really doesn't require any deep thinking or uh, personal exertion in your mind or heart uh, at the facts level. This is, hey, how are you doing? You get past acquaintance and then how was your day? Fine, this happened at the office. Fine, the kids did this today. Uh, fine. Um, hey, I found out. Uh, did you hear about that person and that thing going on over there? I saw an accident on my way to work today. Uh, this kind of thing. You're not really having deep conversation. You're catching up. Um, you're talking about facts. Uh, that's the second level of communication. The third level is this, opinions. The level of opinions. This is sharing ideas with each other. It includes your concerns, your expectations, your goals, your dreams, your desires. Now you're getting in a little bit closer to where your heart's at. You're starting to talk about your own opinions. And I'll say this, it's at this level that most couples begin to struggle. Because you start to, you start to share, you know, honey, I really want to try to um, do a remodel to the kitchen. Well, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> I don't think that we should do that at all. All right? This is, why, this, this, this is when you really start to open up a little bit. And you're exposing yourself to potentially your spouse not agreeing with you and not thinking that, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm too tired to go do that tonight. I think we should invite so-and-so over for dinner. You know what, honey? I don't, I just, I, I, it's been a really busy week at work. I don't think that we should do that. You see what I'm talking about here? You get to the opinion level. And at this level is... A lot of people get scared to come to this level. 
um, because they're not practicing good forms of communication and they're fearful they're going to get rejected at this level. I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want to talk to him about that. I don't think that he'll listen to me. That should not be true about your marriage on one point. But if you're going to communicate deeply, you ought to be able to get to the level of opinion. Now, let me say this. Because this is where conflict starts, a lot of people never get beyond the level of opinion in their communication with each other. And your marriage specifically is what I'm talking about. Never get beyond the level of opinion. That's a problem because we get to the level of opinion by nature with many people in our lives. If there's anybody we should get to a deeper level of communication with, it ought to be our spouse. And so here's the fourth level. The fourth level is the level of feelings. Feelings. All right? This is you sharing your emotions. Sharing how you really feel about your opinion. How you really feel about what you're trying to express. Now, at this point, you've gone through um, what... Uh, uh, one study I, I, I read where I got a lot of this, like, these ideas from, they call it the wall of conflict. You've gone through the wall of conflict, and now you may have gotten some resistance. You might, may have gotten, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. And so now you're put in a position where you just shut yourself down, and you don't communicate on a deeper level, or now you begin to share how you feel about it. All right? I think we really need to do this because you fill in the blank, right? You're really expressing your feelings. Um, honey, I don't think it's a good idea that you get involved in that because it makes me feel insecure. Or I really don't like that person that's involved with that there, and I don't think it's a good idea that we get involved with that. But that makes you really vulnerable. That makes you have to express a weakness on your part, okay? And that's why it's hard for couples to get to this level. That's why it's hard for them to communicate on this level. Because you're putting your feelings out there, and you're potentially going to be rejected for putting your feelings out there, depending on what the health of your relationship is. But if you practice healthy communication principles with each other, you ought to be able to get to the feeling level, and even when you have disagreements, be able to work through them and value each other's opinions, okay? And not shut each other's down, shut each other down, or say hurtful words that are going to turn, turn, turn you away from each other. You ought to be able to, able to get to that fourth level of feelings. And then the fifth and highest level of communication is the uh, communication of needs, okay? This is the deepest level of communication where you feel completely safe to reveal your unique needs with each other. Um, your needs. And a lot of times we get to the area of opinion. I don't think that we can uh, live life with each other without expressing opinions to each other. And we might actually be good about expressing our feelings. Some of you are just naturally good about expressing yourself and expressing how you feel about things. Um, uh, by the way, uh, usually it's one or the other. A lot of times we rag on the women for being the ones that... Uh, are so e it's so easy for them to express themselves, and the men are the ones that they won't ever open up. Um, that's not always true. In some things, I, I, I'm a communicator by profession, all right? And in a lot of ways, it's a lot easier for me to talk to my wife than it is for my wife to talk to me. I understand that there's some of you in here today, it might be her that has a lot harder time opening up, okay? But it's important that you listen to each other and encourage each other so that you can get to the place where you're expressing your needs to each other. A lot of the problems that come up in our marriages come because we don't feel like we have anybody to talk about what we're struggling with, including our spouse. I, can't, I can't tell her. <laughs> she's, just gonna, she's just going to, to shut me down. I can't, I can't talk to him about this. And so we go talk to somebody else. And that's not how it should be person that we should be able to talk to about the deepest, darkest, or brightest secrets of our heart should number one be the Lord, and number two should be our spouse. But it's not just going to happen. That's what I'm saying here tonight. You're not just going to walk home tonight and, well, I haven't ever talked to you about this before, but let me just pour it all out there. For you. <laughs> it's not going to work that way. You can try it, but it, uh, you probably won't. You'll probably, you'll probably chicken out, all right? 
But if you learn to begin to express your opinions to each other and communicate your feelings to each other, it'll naturally lead you to a place of ultimate vulnerability where you can talk about what your real needs are with each other. And that's, that's really where we want to get to in our relationships. And that's very really important for us to understand there. Now, listen, um, communication is really a, a foundational principle for our marriages, for our relationships. If you're struggling with your communication, it's something you need to deal with right now. You may think the issue is this other thing over here, all right? The uh, uh, physical, intima- in- physical intimacy issue or fighting over the kids or, or uh, your finances or uh, spiritual apathy. Well, if he was just more of a spiritual person, then our home would be better. And you may think that the issues are over here, one of these things, when what the issue may really be is you're not talking to each other. You're misunderstanding each other. You're making assumptions about each other. You're allowing all these problems into your home because you're just not talking. The decision you need to make tonight is to, by God's grace, let God help you better your communication as husbands and wives.